today you're going to learn about the laboratory and scientific method. Okay, first you have your scientific method. You guys should have seen this before. First thing, the scientist poses a testable beginning question about a system or a process. We will come up with a beginning question every time we do a lab. That part is the question. You need to write in your notes this part and question where it says scientific method, number one. You're gonna write question, dash, and then all of this. So if you need to pause the video, pause the video. Next one, the scientist makes qualitative and or quantitative observations. We are gonna go over what qualitative and quantitative means in just a moment. That would be the observation and research part of the scientific method. Next one. Okay, next step of the scientific method is that the scientist formulates a hypothesis or a possible explanation for the observation. A valid hypothesis meets two criteria. It must use conditional language, such as may or might statements, and it must be testable, which means you have to be able to test it. And by the way, feelings are not testable. Okay, four step. Scientist designs a process or method that makes appropriate measurements. This is the experiment that will either support or refute the hypothesis. <clears throat> Based on the results of the experiment, the scientist either supports or refines their hypothesis. So when they analyze their data, they see if the hypothesis is supported or refu refuted, and then they take steps from there. Okay, types of data. This is when we're going to talk about the qualitative, quantitative. A scientist makes qualitative and or quantitative observations. Qualitative is based on descriptions like color, clarity, or texture. Now, qualitative and quantitative look a lot alike. This is how I remember it. The L in qualitative, I say looks like. Okay, that's how I remember what it looks like. So if you're giving any descriptors like color, clarity, texture, anything that does not have a number, that is qualitative. If it has a number or a quantity, it is quantitative data. <clears throat> so mass, volume, and length are examples of quantitative data. Okay, now let's talk about scientific law versus scientific theory. So what's the difference? Well, scientific law, you need to write this down in your notes. It's a concise factual statement that it's meant to prove an observation. It's accepted to be true by all scientists. It's often expressed as a mathematical equation. I would like for you now to think of an example of a scientific law and write it in your notes. Now remember, often, not always, expressed as a mathemat whoops, a mathematical equation. Sorry about that. Okay, scientific theory. It's an explanation of a natural or physical phenomenon based upon proven multiple hypotheses and verified multiple times by independent researchers. Theories often include laws in order to prove their point. I'd like for you to find an example of a scientific theory and write it in your notes. Okay, now let's talk about variables. Independent variable is a variable that the scientist is changing it affects the dependent variable and it's graphed on the x-axis. Now, how I remember it, independent starts with the letter I. It is the variable that I change if I'm the scientist. It's dependent variable. <clears throat> it's the variable that's usually measured in response to a change because of the independent variable. The dependent variable depends on the independent variable. The dependent variable, they're the results that you measure and record, and it is graphed on the y-axis. So remember here, we got this, this is dependent. Dependent variable, independent variable. Control variables, they're held constant by the scientist and allow comparison of only independent and dependent variables. You need to be careful, this is different than the control group. Control variables and control groups are two different things. A control variable, an example, would be maintaining constant temperature in the lab during an experiment because you don't want temperature changing to affect whatever it is you're measuring. Human mistakes are sources of error. A human mistakes is a whoops 
It's because the procedure in the lab was not followed or something was done incorrectly. For instance, if you measured the wrong amount, it said to measure five grams, you measured six grams. <clears throat> okay, a source of error. Okay, source of error. That's a limitation of the procedure. Could the procedure be done more precisely? Think measurements. So an example would be, um, did you use a graduated cylinder or did you use a beaker? If you used a beaker and it would be more precise to use a graduated cylinder, then that could be a source of error. Could the procedure be done with less contamination? Were the variables to be held constant really held constant? What assumptions were made in collecting of the data? And was there a level of subjectivity in interpreting the data? Lab safety, first, foremost, wear goggles at all times. Wear closed-toed shoes to all labs to prevent chemical spills and broken glass on your feet. This should say glass, not glass. Wear an apron during all labs. Eating and drinking, which includes chewing gum, are not allowed during a lab. Wash your hands before leaving to prevent contamination on your hands and pull back hair into a ponytail. Use a fume hood for any reaction that may produce harmful toxic gases. Never put extra chemicals back into the bottle. You can contaminate the rest of the chemical and that will affect other uh, lab results. Always dispose of chemicals the way I tell you to, or the teacher. Smell chemicals by wafting, like this man's doing. Point heated test tubes away from other people and yourself. Always add acid into water when diluting the acid. You can remember that by using the saying A and W. A instead of and, it's A N W, so acid in water. Okay, so what should you do if an emergency happens? You always tell the teacher. Spills. If you spill an acid, you add baking soda or a weak base to neutralize it before wiping it up. And if you spill a base, you always add vinegar or a weak acid to neutralize it. Use the eye wash for chemicals in your eye, if they're spilt in your eye, and <clears throat> the safety shower if harmful chemicals get onto your body. For small fires, use an inverted beaker. Now what that means is, here's your beaker. La, 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 la. Okay, um, and let's say, I'm not a very good drawer, but here's your flame. And so what you're going to do is you're going to take that beaker and you're going to put it over it. Okay, so there's your beaker. That'll put out the flame. Okay, if somebody's on fire, you use the fire blanket. Safety vocabulary. Corrosive, eats away at objects, attacks and burns skin. Toxic means poisonous. Flammable means easily set on fire or combustible. <clears throat> Carcinogenic can cause cancer. Radioactive spontaneously emits radiation resulting from changes in the nucleus of the atom. That is our last, last unit, by the way. Uh, and last is irritant. It causes a rash or an allergic reaction. Okay, now we're going to talk about the NFPA hazard diamond. NFPA stands for National Fire Protection Association. So on your notes, you need to write what each one of these means, each one of these diamonds. So the top one is the flammability diamond. The one on the right is the reactivity. Bottom is the special information diamond. And the one on the left is the health hazard diamond. Now I would like for you to color them. Don't put any numbers in them right now. Just color them. So the <clears throat> flammability is the red. Reactivity is yellow. Information is white. And the health hazard is the blue. Okay, the numbers on the diamond represent <clears throat> the danger for the specified hazard. Zero represents, zero represents no hazard. One represents a slight hazard. Two is a moderate hazard, three is extreme, and four is deadly. MSDS stands for Material Safety Data Sheets. They are bulletins, and they're developed to communicate the potential hazards to users of chemicals. That's what we use them for. 
An MSDS also includes information such as physical chemical properties, storage instructions, first aid, and disposal procedures. So this is an example of an uh, <clears throat> MSD sheet, hydrochloric acid. Now, do we need to be concerned with the flammability of hydrochloric acid? Well, this is where we're going to look, right here, under Section 3, the Hazards Identification. And it says here that the flammability is zero, and zero is no hazard. So, do we need to be concerned? The answer should be no. All right, what should we do if someone accidentally swallows this substance? We're going to look over here under first aid measures, and it says internal, that's if we swallow it. Give one to two cups of water or milk, followed by gastric antacid such as milk of magnesia. Do not induce vomiting and call a physician or poison control at once. So how should we store this substance? I would like for you to pause the video, look where you should find that information, how you're going to store it, and write it down. You should have gotten your answer in Section 7. What are some health hazards we should be concerned of with this substance? Pause the video, find the answer on your MSD sheet, and write it down. You should have found it in Section 3. Should this substance be used in a fume hood? Pause the video. There are two places you can find the answer on this, this one. You can find it in the health hazards. Right here it says constantly fuming. And you can also find it down here in handling and storage. Use and dispose, or dispense, I'm sorry. Use and dispense in a hood. What happens if this substance touches skin? Pause the video and write down your answer. You should have found your answer in the hazards section. If this substance is spilled, how would you clean it up? You find that in the accidental release measures. 